There's a storm across the valley The clouds are rolling in The afternoon is heavy on your shoulders There's a truck out on the four lane A mile or more away The whining of his wheels just makes it colder. Welcome to Community Farm. Today is Friday the 13th, 2020. But it's a lucky day for us because I am welcoming today one of our uh, most illustrious citizens in Easton, uh, Masa Kamba Ayi. Did I pronounce that correctly? So the, yes, the American way is Kanbabi, and then the Persian way is Khanbabai. Khanbabai, okay. Um, and welcome to the show, Masa. Thank you so much, Priscilla. I'm really happy to be here. Yes, and my name is Priscilla Almquist Olson, and uh, I am welcoming our viewers at home through Zoom. We're still in COVID times, and we need to be very safe and uh, protect protect our fellow citizens. So Masa, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, I understand that you came to the States with your family as, a, as an infant. Um, give us a little bit about that, why your family came. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so my parents and I moved to the United States in the early 70s, mm -hmm. I was just a baby um, because my father was coming to uh, engage in his medical residency training program. He was lucky enough to be accepted to a training program at UMass Memorial. And um, so after he finished medical school in Iran, he came to do his residency. We all came on a visa known as the J-1. And the J-1 visa requires physicians to return back to their home country after they get their training. Um, but unfortunately for us, we uh, couldn't go back because the Iran-Iraq Iraq war started and there was a revolution and it was very dangerous. Um, you know, my grandmother and my uncles and aunts and many, many cousins um, had their lives at risk with bombings in Tehran and everyone told us don't come back. And so we ended up staying and my father and, and us, we moved to a small town in Western Mass where he was the only OBGYN for many, many years. And um, it, it, it became our home. And, it, and what was fascinating was that it was a small community hospital, but there were actually physicians from all around the world there, just like my dad, from Argentina to Philippines, India, Egypt, Korea. And it was a really beautiful community of all of these international doctors and their kids. Um, so it was kind of a home away from home when you couldn't see your family because it was going through war. Yes, those were difficult times. Um, <clears throat> I know because uh, I helped um, friends escape uh, once from the Shaw, and then again from Khomeini. So uh, quite, uh, quite an incredibly difficult place to, to stay alive and, and to work and grow and, and so forth. Uh, and it's still not safe. Um, hopefully it will be so that you can return and, and meet some of your relatives that you've never met. Well, actually I have to say, we were really lucky that after the war ended, um, we've been able to go back many times to visit family. And I was actually hey. supposed to go this year. My grandmother is now 95 years old and I was supposed to go and see her this year because I haven't seen her for three years now. Um, but unfortunately with COVID-19, it's not safe to go right now. Iran is really suffering quite badly with um, widespread uh, cases of COVID and definitely a lack of medical mm -hmm. supplies due to sanctions. And so people are really suffering there. Yeah. Now, uh, you're an immigration lawyer and you have a practice in the former Northeastern Grammar School on Main Street in Northeastern, a grammar school I attended. Uh, and uh, tell me, uh, what made you go into the law? We all have our reasons. My, my reasons were political and it had to do with the uh, Vietnam War, the women's rights movement and civil rights movements during the 1960s. And that uh, compelled me to um, uh, consider law. And so I'm retired now, 
but you must have your reasons too, what are they? Well, it sounds like you and I um, have a lot in common, Priscilla, in terms of there are certain things that we're passionate about and it's led us to, to, to take certain career paths. Um, so like you, um, I was really, um, I think, affected by going through the immigration process myself. Um, you know, that, that J-1 visa that I talked about, it requires someone to go back home for two years, but we obviously couldn't do that. Um, and so we were able to get a waiver of that requirement and stay here and get a green card and become citizens. But that took many, many years. Um, back then, actually, I remember going back to going to the police station many times in the small little town, um, predominantly, you know, white Polish immigrant town. And here I am, um, you know, a dark haired uh, Middle Eastern girl with a funny name and having to get fingerprinted at the police station to, to be able to get our green cards and files getting lost and, and all of that sort of thing. And so um, I think that always was in the back of my mind and I just loved working with people from around the world. And so when I graduated from law school, it, I just started my own practice. I was a single mom and realized that, oh, look, I, I understand people from other countries. I understand a little bit about the immigration process. Let me try that out until I figure out what I'm doing with my life. And 20 years later, that's what I've been doing with my life. Um, so I've been loving every moment of it and basically work with primarily businesses that have a really difficult time finding American doctors uh, to come and work for them uh, because of where they're located or the patients that they see or you know, low reimbursement rates oftentimes with different health insurance depending on the state. And so I'll work with community health centers and community hospitals so that they can have um, the top-notch doctors from around the world come and work there. Um, so I help with all of mm -hmm. those visa needs, green cards, or someone wants to bring, for example, a family member from Germany or Switzerland, or you know, a spouse from uh, Morocco. I'll help with all of the visa and immigration needs. Um, I see from around the world. So I imagine your assisting hospitals uh, has much to do with your father's. Uh, influence your father as a medical doctor. Yes. Uh, and I know that you uh, represent other immigrants too, other people who are here who want to have a path to citizenship. Maybe you could tell us, uh, without giving names, some of the more interesting cases you've had. Yeah, so there's one case that I'm working on right now that's really tragic, actually. I've written about it um, in some pieces. Uh, of a young Syrian girl whose father had been captured by ISIS um, in their town in Syria. And after finally being able to pay a bribe, the father was released. Um, the family was hoping to stay in that town, but realized that you know, ISIS was still going to be there. And so they fled to a refugee camp along the Turkish border. And while she was there, um, helping take care of her younger brothers and sisters and heat up some bath water. She was burned horribly by um, the kerosene that was being used. And so her father fled with her to Turkey to get her some life-saving basic treatment. Um, they were eventually resettled in Germany and been living there now for about a year or, so, or longer. And she still needs obviously significant medical attention. She has burns over 50% of her body on her mm. face, on her hands. It's disfiguring, um, it's very, very painful for her. And so she's applied for a visa to come to the United States. She was accepted at, Bur at Shriners um, in Boston for a burn treatment, um, world renowned uh, facility. Uh, so she was accepted for medical treatment for free with no cost. Um, with free housing, all from the help of kind, you know, caring people both in Germany and in the United States. Um, but unfortunately, her visa has been denied because her father um, had a, you know, interaction with ISIS. Um, and that interaction now is preventing them from getting a visa. So I'm still trying to work on her case um, to see what we can do about getting a waiver uh, for them, because obviously they are not material uh, supporters of terrorist organizations. They're a refugee family that fled that uh, torture and terrorism. So there are certain cases like that, humanitarian cases that I've just been really fortunate enough to work on. And um, then, uh, I mean, that's probably... Uh, well, um, that's a horrific case. 
And um, I'm sure you're going to let the authorities understand that he was a victim of ISIS brutality. He was not a um, uh, collaborator, but that his, he, he was fortunate to be released. He was lucky to make it out alive. Yes. Um, and and um, he fled as a refugee and um, people don't flee if, if they're guilty, you know. He was in state and um, been associated with, with, he wasn't. So um, I'm, I'm really at a loss to understand. Um, perhaps the original application um, was uh, not written precisely and, and with all of that information. No, I mean, unfortunately, the immigration laws are really rigid in many ways. And so the definition of, you know, what is material support of a terrorist organization has, has actually under the Trump administration be, been made even more stringent and restrictive. So that if a person is under duress, uh, forced to pay a bribe, for example, that's still going to be considered material support of a terrorist organization. So we're hoping that under the Biden administration, that we'll have uh, a much yes. more fair and reasonable and humane immigration uh, system. Yeah, I'm sure that, that it will. And you'll be successful one more time. I hope so. um, because I know that um, you have been uh, serving not just the <clears throat> people in this region, but uh, around the country. Um, uh, I have my very, very good friend that I grew up with has a son who um, uh, is now um, very much involved in, uh, and uh, on Facebook, I read about all of the accomplishments and the wonderful um, rejections and that have been turned around so that now they're uh, becoming United States citizens after many years. Those are wonderful stories and the people who become United States citizens are really so grateful mm -hmm. and so pleased and, uh, <clears throat> and I'm sure that you're, you're representing a lot of professionals so that those people are contributing to the welfare of our country. And no matter <clears throat> what the person does, they're contributing, they're paying taxes and they're creating a multicultural and diverse country and much more interesting uh, country yeah. as a result. Well, okay. so, so tell me a little bit about um, your involvement with the uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association. I know that you were chair in the past. Um, how, what, what does that group do? Yeah, so the American Immigration Lawyers Association, or as we call it, AILA, is the professional bar association for immigration attorneys throughout the U.S. and the world. And we have several different chapters, including the New England chapter, which you just mentioned that I was the chair of last year and this year. I still serve on the board as immediate past chair. And essentially, our job is to help the 800 or so immigration attorneys in the New England region um, with all of the changes in immigration policy and, and how they can be better lawyers and, and enrich their education and their experiences as attorneys. And then um, I'm also serving right now on the national level at the Board of Governors. So I um, just was elected. And uh, essentially what our, our job is to try to help immigration lawyers all across the country and to liaise with the government uh, to explain what are some of the issues that immigration attorneys and um, our clients are experiencing. So I, I serve on the State Department Committee and have the um, immense fortune, good fortune of meeting with State Department officials on a quarterly basis to talk to them about what are some of the cases that we're seeing, trends that we're seeing, problems at U.S. embassies, for example, for U.S. citizen services, to individuals trying to get visa appointments but having difficulty doing so. And um, it's been really rewarding. It's a, it's a wonderful collegial immigration bar. And um, yeah, we've had a lot to do these last few years. I know that the camaraderie and support is, is both professional but also personal. And in your job, I can just imagine how stressful it can become at times. And, and the anxiety that you experience um, for your clients, it's not easy. It's true, um, you know, healthcare professionals, law enforcement, they're all trained how to deal with trauma. Um, they see terrible things every day. 
and they're trained how to deal with them. And it has obviously still a toll on them. Um, unfortunately, immigration lawyers, we haven't had that training. And there's been lots of trauma that we've witnessed from you know, families being separated at the border, children not being able to be with their parents and, and, the, and the lifetime of issues that those children and the parents will have to you know, even cases right now with some of the doctors that I work with, um, they're treating COVID patients. And they're afraid that if they contract COVID and die, what will happen to their spouse, to their child that's here on a temporary visa? And will they be able to stay here? I mean, this is the home that they've known, you know, for let's say a decade or so. Um, but because the green card, uh, green card lines are so long for certain citizens like India, they don't know if their spouse and their children will be safe and be able to stay here. So there's a lot of um, secondary trauma that immigration attorneys have had. And so, yeah, the Bar Association has really done a lot to try to help with wellness uh, issues and uh, in, in terms of attorneys being able to deal with it. Okay, so um, is the national organization um, pursuing any programs to help those 545 children who uh, were separated from their parents at the Mexican border um, and, and have not even found their parents. Mm -hmm. and it's yeah, a national the organization. Numbers, <clears throat> yeah, the numbers are actually growing. It's over 600 now that have been identified. Um, 600 children whose parents can't be found. They don't know what's happened to them, where they are. And um, yeah, our bar association has a sister organization, the American Immigration Council, AIC. And AIC is the one that's really doing a lot in terms of trying to um, find ways to assist and find ways to be able to then help these children and their parents. One thought I had was to do a massive um, uh, information campaign in the countries. Um, and if you know what country these children come from, um, to target uh, people to let them know they can come to the United, to the United States embassy in that country, take a DNA test, and then be matched. Uh, has that been tried? I'm not sure. You know, I haven't been involved in the details of that. It's, you know, what, what we're all concerned about is, you know, how appalling is it that our government has lost parents of these children, right? Yet at the same time, they're able to pinpoint someone who's overstayed their visa by two days uh, and immediately find them. Uh, so the priorities of this administration in terms of who are they looking for? Are they looking for children you know, and their parents who've been separated, no fault of their own, but due to the government's fault? Or are they going after innocent people who may have overstayed their visa by a day or two and immediately picking them up? So there's a lot to answer for <laughs> in this administration. Well, with the next administration, administration uh, those those problems will vanish and there'll be the compassion that has been lacking the past four years. So um, no. <clears throat> tell us a little bit about Save the Children. Uh, it's an international organization and many of us support Save the Children. Uh, and you made a trip to Lebanon, I understand last year. And tell me, are you a, an official um, delegate of Save the Children, an official representative? Yeah, so Save the Children, like you said, is, is a really amazing organization that helps children all around the world, mm -hmm. including here in the United States, in making sure that they have access to you know, life-saving healthcare, um, to education, to so many different things. And um, I'm involved with the Boston chapter of uh, Save the Children. We started about two and a half years ago now. Uh, we have a Facebook page. If anyone's interested, you can do a little Google search for the Boston Leadership Council. And um, we did a, a fundraiser two years ago and raised money to buy two mobile libraries that go around to the different refugee camps in Lebanon uh, where Syrian children and their families are displaced currently because of the war and the problems in Syria. Uh, there is a million refugees right now in Lebanon. It's mm. an incredibly dangerous situation for many reasons, especially the instability in Lebanon, the economic disaster there right now, the government um, you know, infighting and, and significant problems, and you have COVID on top of it. 
Um, so we are still trying to support uh, the, the team there, the Save the Children team there, because they just really do amazing work. I, I can't say enough about how touched I was about the, the true generosity and care of all of these workers at the mm -hmm. refugee camps. You could tell they just loved working with these children, educating them, you know, sharing books and crayons and, and things with the children in these refugee camps where the conditions were, I mean, it, it was heartbreaking. I would never wanna see any child in that situation. Um, it, it was really, really um, very sad. <clears throat> Well, I, I saw an article uh, and a photo of you surrounded by those children and uh, it was very moving and uh, educational because unless people like you go to these places, very often we don't hear about it. Uh, occasionally through the media, but, um, you know, that personal uh, journey means a lot, not just to you, but to the public at large. Um, I know I appreciated your contribution in that regard. And I'm sure our listeners and viewers do also. Um, so what, is, what are the plans for uh, the plans in this time of COVID um, to raise money for safety for children? Yeah, we're actually, our, the Boston Leadership Chapter is specifically looking at Yemen right now. Um, the conditions in Yemen are absolutely, you know, inhumane right now. Um, with the fighting going on, with the lack of food and, and basic human necessities. We're trying to supplement some of the funding there. It's it's very dangerous situation. A lot of international mm. relief organizations just cannot, um, don't have the capacity to actually help people there. Um, but Save the Children does have uh, a, a presence there and is really trying to do the best it can under really difficult conditions. Um, we also were looking at a literacy program uh, here in the United States, in the Tennessee area. There are certain sections of Tennessee where ch young children really don't have adequate access um, to books and, and other supplies that they need for school. And we also um, have been doing a lot related to children at the border pre-COVID. Um, you know, post-COVID it's been really difficult. Uh, and so a lot of the NGOs work together to try to best use the resources that each organization has. Wow, there are so many problems and challenges in the world and um, one doesn't know where to put one's resources. We have to pick and choose. Um, I know I was a member of several environmental groups and I decided that um, I would, you know, just choose the one with all the lawyers and that's earth justice <laughs> because they're bringing the cases and they're making the changes. So I support earth justice. I also support Inter um, uh, Amnesty International, um, which is in saving lives of uh, people who are human rights activists and other people who have been imprisoned and tortured by authoritarian governments. So, um, and Save the Children is a wonderful organization which has been around for decades. And it's good to know that they're also uh, supporting the needs of children in Appalachia and uh, other areas of poverty. And um, that's great. Yeah, so, so in case any of your um, viewers are interested, um, Save the Children has a program where you can adopt a child uh, from anywhere in the world, you can go online and pick a child and then you can make a monthly contribution uh, to help that child with whatever needs they have from school supplies to, you know, health and health access. And so you could pick a child, for example, you know, here somewhere in the Appalachian region and a child somewhere else in the world. And it's, it's really rewarding. I assume you can communicate with that child too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Child can communicate with you. You know, I support a child. In and your letters family. and pictures. We have three children that um, we've um, adopted through this process. One in Egypt, one in um, Malawi, and one in Indonesia. And so my kids get to write to them and hear back from them. It's, it's really nice. It's wonderful for, ch for children to see that because you want them to continue the mission uh, that you've adopted. 
I, I uh, have, uh, I support a girl in Uganda um, since she was four. She, she just turned eight yesterday. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. So, uh, and I can send handwritten letters to her and I can also use the, uh, the internet. I can send, uh, you know, letters through the internet and attach photos. So yesterday I, I did that and I attached photos of myself with my uh, two adult children and, uh, and also a, um, a, a photo of my two grandchildren. And all, the third one was a, a dog that I am rescuing from North Carolina, which I will get in the beginning of December, uh, named Cruiser. That's <laughs> so, I'm sure she liked that. that yes. And actually, I don't know if you knew this, Priscilla, but um, you can actually go to that um, wherever that child is and visit them. So my plan was that in 2021 to take my children to Africa to go to the you know Egypt and Malawi to go and visit um, mm -hmm. the children. I don't think that's going to happen with COVID next year, but hopefully uh, sometime in the near future we'll be able to do that. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so um, you were. Uh, You've been an immigration lawyer now for how many years? 20 years. Oh no, 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> so you are very experienced. And um, I'm sure that our viewers perhaps know people who are on a visa or, or are having problems with um, the immigration service. So what would you recommend to them to come to see you? How would they get in touch with you? Yeah, definitely. I'm happy to always talk to anybody. Um, the best way to reach out is by email, uh, because especially these days, I'm not always in the office and working remotely from home sometimes. So sending me an email is great. Uh, but we do um, generally have someone in the office. And so they could always call. Okay. And for the viewers, we'll put all the information uh, at the end of this program so that you can write that down and, and see it. Also, um, this program, Community Forum, is um, developed through ECAT. Uh, and so it will be broadcast on the cable station. However, if any of you who are looking at this and you want some of your friends to see it, um, they can go uh, online and view this interview or any interviews under community forum uh, by going by this uh, site, easterncat.org. So easterncat.org will bring you to all of the programs, whether it's the um, meetings of the select board in town or my program, community forum, uh, or other programs that are continuing through the technology of Zoom which we are very much appreciate, appreciative of. So um, any closing words that you'd like to, to share with us? Well, I just um, thank you all for the work that you do and helping welcome your neighbors um, who are immigrants and making them feel involved. As oftentimes immigrants will feel shy and not really want to speak out. They just want to kind of you know, fly under the radar and, and try to fit in. So, you know, please, think of them and, and be supportive and find out how you might be able to help them. And um, I've written a few pieces talking a little bit about this for Miss Magazine. So feel free to, to take a look at that if you wanna understand a little bit more about the mindset of how an immigrant might feel, especially these days and how you could be supportive. Yes, and locally, um, the Ames Free Library sponsors a program for uh, English speaking foreigners Immigrants need to learn English as a second language, um, and um, I am—I was me, uh, helping every Thursday with the conversation side of it, um, and helping the Julian, who is a wonderfully dedicated teacher, um, with the program. And there, I couldn't believe the people from Iran, from Kyrgyzstan, Italy. Um, and um, oh dear, let's see, Jamaica, and all uh, people from all over the world in, in that class. So there's always a need for assistance. And if, if you're interested, call the Ames Free Library and ask to um, speak to Julie or, or someone who 
can refer you to her so that you can get involved and help. It's, it's, it's a very rewarding um, experience. So, um, okay, so, um, and I also want to mention that you have been interviewed on the radio and I think on TV, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a chance to mention that, you know, last year there was a significant change with the immigration policy related to particularly young uh, people who are here uh, who are very ill and need medical care and were allowed to be able to extend their visas to stay here for that medical attention. And then the um, Trump administration ended that program secretly and individuals started to get denial notices. And I had a couple of clients affected by that program. Massachusetts had a significant number of individuals as well because we have top hospitals uh, here in the, in the area. And so I had the amazing fortune of being on Rachel Maddow's show a couple of times, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell and a few others to talk about this policy, the impacts on families and individuals and then I also have been involved in some of the high profile cases at Logan Airport where Iranian students were turned away and deported from the airport without mm. any um, you know, explanation of what happened. And um, you know, it's something that we're still working on and trying to get a better understanding of why this has happened because this now affects these students opportunities to study anywhere else in the world. It's not just that they can't come here to the United States after having been accepted at some of the top universities in the country uh, for really important research uh, in engineering to AI to medicine. And now they will also be impacted in their ability to go and study in another country because now that other country will see that, oh, the United States deported you from the airport and banned you for five years. Um, there must be something going on and nothing is going on. Um, and so now these poor students, right, with lack of resources and, you know, they've spent years studying hard and, and trying to get their PhD and now they're, they've been stopped in their tracks. So I've been able to work on a lot of cases like that where I've um, been interviewed uh, mm -hmm. by local and national press. It's been really amazing. Well, that's wonderful. So I, I knew you were a celebrity. <laughs> and, I don't know and, about that. <laughs> no, but it's a wonderful contribution that you're making for understanding the myriad of problems that exist, uh, whether it's students or whether it's parents and families trying to get in um, uh, or to have their visas extended or whatever it is. These are heart-wrenching uh, situations at times. Yeah, I mean, I've been so fortunate to have the background that I do, both in my family history and my own personal experience with the immigration system and having a law degree. Um, that confluence has come together at, um, at a time where I feel like I can try to help. Uh, so it's, it's been really a blessing. I know. Well, we thank you and we're grateful for your service. Um, you. It's wonderful that there's somebody like you that people can turn to in their desperate moments. So we thank you. And thank you for appearing today on Community Forum. I appreciate it. Yes, and continue your good work and thank your success for immigrants and refugees. Um, it's so important work and, and we wish you well. And this you. is Priscilla Almquist Olson. Thanks. This is Priscilla Almquist Olson saying uh, goodbye. For now, until next time, Stay well, stay safe. Bye-bye, thank you.